Hello, my name is Gabriela Mafra, and I'm here to talk to you about a little bit of my work on generating code from TLA plus specifications. Uh, here's an outline for the presentation, so I'll try to give a little background on why I'm doing this and when I think this makes sense and just discuss this a little bit and then try to show you how it works and what I want to do next with with this, okay? So a little bit of an introduction. Um, uh, I want to introduce myself a little bit so you can understand why why I make I made some decisions, okay? So um, I did this research while I was I was pursuing my bachelor in computer science, which uh, I got in 2019. Uh, and while I was uh, undergraduate student, I got interested in fun functional programming really soon, so in my first years, and and I actually kind of learned functional programming. Uh, at the same time as I, I learned like traditional imperative programming, and uh, while while I was uh, I was an undergraduate student, I also did some research in type systems, and so that's fun. And I, right now I'm working full time for some years with web development, and actually uh, I got lucky, and I'm I'm working on some really interesting projects. Uh, that use distributed systems and we actually have to think <laughs> on what we are doing, so that's fun. Uh, and I came into contact with CLA Plus in 2018. So I'm pretty much like I'm, I, st I study and I work and so my mind is on both places at the same time. So and that have, has a lot to do with what this is doing, right? So generating code from specifications I think it makes sense. And on this research specifically on code generation, uh, this is purely academic. So I did this for my bachelor thesis and it was, what I did was just a little prototype. It's not like a, a usable tool in production, not even close to it, but um, I want to talk more about the idea and like I have like some Proofs of concept for it, okay? <laughs> Nothing um, really usable <laughs> right now, and it's pretty much on hold because uh, when I finished the when I when I graduated, I had to I started my masters, and my masters is like on a kind of different subject, so I I couldn't continue on working on it. So uh, I just want to be real with you and um, clarify that this is like something that's a little bit stuck at the moment, but I would like to come back to it once I, f once I finish my master's. So I want to firstly discuss a little bit on why this makes sense, right? Or when does it make sense to generate code? Uh, I'm not here to try to argue that it's always going to be useful or not in, even close to that, but um, I, I, I figure it's a nice discussion to have before I introduce to you what I actually did. So starting from the beginning, right? What is TLA plus? I, I like to describe TLA plus as a very good language to model transition systems, right? So it's very easy to write, very beautiful to, to define transition systems in TLA plus. With a single TLA plus statement, you can define a bunch of transitions. Uh, it's very powerful. You can write like x in the next state equals to the value of x in this state plus one. And you are modeling a bunch of transitions from one to two, two to three, three to four, etc. So it's a powerful language to do that, but transition systems are actually pretty simple systems uh, used, used for many, many stuff. So when I say transition systems, I refer about like state machines or types of transition systems, cryptic crypt structures. Uh, and people use these transition systems to all kinds of stuff. Uh, there's a number of ways to use it and to reason about it. And it's not only used to write like super abstracted and mathematical concepts and ideas, right? So it's used to model like um, industry systems and real things that are happening to a state. 
So with that in mind, if, if, we, if we are defining a transition system, maybe this transition system is actually something that's real, that can work, or it can be like a complete abstraction that is not even tangible in the real world, right? Transition systems are as general as that. So uh, this is a, a thing to, to notice. Uh, a point of this, um, what, I can what I want to show with this uh, generation as well is that uh, just like plus calc translates better to imperative code, and this is an argument uh, for even plus call being a thing, so oh, maybe engineers can't reason so much about like this TLA mathematical syntax. Maybe uh, we have we should have we should have a language that can it's closer to what they understand to the imperative code they are used to. So uh, plus call is closer to that. But I want to show, and I I, I think I can I could do this. Uh, how TLA plus can translate well to functional programming. So. I'm used to functional code that I told you in my background that I started with functional programming. And when I look at TLA plus, I can map it real simply to functional code in my head. And I think that if I show this to people and show like, oh, this TLA plus spec uh, and this is equivalent to this piece of functional code, then it, the, the, this person would reason about TLA plus specs much better, right? They would understand. Um, how these transitions are actually working. Uh, so this is a hypothesis, right? So I would have to actually show people and, and try to understand. But I, I, I think that if the people s see the generated code, uh, and, I, and I, I will talk about this later, but um, one of the goals here for me is to make the gener gen generated code very readable, uh, so easy to read. And so if, if the people read this code and, and for a spec that, that she doesn't know and maybe they would understand the code and they would that will help them understand the spec, right? Um, and as an example for um, when this could be useful, I was I actually did a case study uh, on a pump station. I, I found like I had to read a, a pump station article for my IoT class. And while while I, re I was reading it, uh, I thought that the system they were specifying on that article was the kind of system that would be useful to generate code from, right? So what happened there was they have like a pump station with a bunch of, of pumps. They have to alternate between certain pumps. There are some pumps that would have to be um, turned on only on emergency situations. So there was a priority between them. And they specified the, uh, an algorithm to do this control for these pumps. And they showed this uh, specification with, with like an ASCII C, so a bunch of diagrams. They showed it to the, to the local gov governments the, and the government had to approve it. So And then they, had, they did a bunch of simulations to verify some properties, sort of, and they then implemented in the, the real pump station. So what I did uh, is I, I've i specified the, their system on TLA+, plus, and then I generated an Elixir code, and I actually made it so the Elixir code generated could uh, actually run on an IoT context. So... I, I wrote uh, an MQTT mod module that uses like a IoT protocol to connections to to make communications between hypothetical sensors. And there was a case study like oh, on this specific case, I think code generation would be useful because uh, the the people that specified that wrote the system, they could have like actually specified it on a formal language like TLA plus and the properties that the government verified could actually be proven. And they would, as a bonus, <laughs> get uh, undistributed uh, code working uh, so they can maybe run simulations or even implement it on the, the real facility. So just an as, as an example for what I'm thinking in my mind when I say that in some cases this should be uh, useful somehow. 
so still on the subject on how, on how I see this being used uh, on the real, real world, um, I want to bring a little bit of context from my software engineer perspective. And uh, we use Kanban. And Kanban divides a flow between upstream and downstream. And as you can see in this image, uh, in upstream, you have to first do some sort of analysis and then uh, after some better understanding of some task, then uh, you, you send it to downstream where it's actually implemented and developed. So uh, we we call this also discovery. So upstream is called discovery. We are trying, trying to understand and discover any and remove any uncertainties about some task. And what we do is often like try to um, draw some diagrams and understand if something would actually solve our problem. And we try to avoid any um, concurrent scenarios that would uh, be incorrect. So we try to think about a lot of that. And then we, sh we show our peers, right? Oh, so I, I think the solution is going to work because uh, it uh, it avoids this concurrent scenario. It it fixes this problem and yet add. So and when in this stage we actually often implement a proof of concept for our idea, our, our idea, and this proof of concept is actually discarded after this step. So we write like uh, ugly code, right? Just fast, so we can show how something would act would wor work. And then we discarded and then implemented it with like TDD and uh, more carefully, <laughs> a, a more careful implementation on the actually downstream process and more times, right? So, and uh, every time I think about like modeling something in TLA plus and then checking some properties, I that this reminds me of this uh, discovery process, right? Because we are actually modeling a solution, writing an algorithm that solves the problem, and we try to check that work it works somehow. But I don't see how using TLA plus right now uh, it's I would like I would I don't know how I would convince my boss to let me spend time writing a TLA plus specification, right? I, I feel like I don't have enough arguments maybe. So I, an argument I think that might help is if I would tell, tell my boss that, oh, if I write a tele plus spec, I can not only verify properties, but I can't get a functional proof of concept that we can plug in, into some data and see it actually working with production data, some, something like that. Not necessarily something that could go to production uh, because that would have to be like a very, uh, reliable code generation process, right? So so you can directly ship it something to production. But I see that for this uh, intermediate process on the development, the generated code could be a, a nice uh, artifact. So we, you could test, we can show your our peers how it's actually working. And it, it would work like a nice artifact on the, the software engineering standard development process using Kanban, for example. So I, I, would, I just wanted to show you a, bit, a little bit of this perspective as well. Now that I explained to you my perspective on how this is important and when this could be perhaps used, uh, let's talk about how I actually implemented it and how it actually works. And first of all, I think I should explain why I chose uh, the Elixir language to generate code to. And uh, for those of you who don't never heard, who never heard of Elixir, uh, it's a Brazilian programming language. Uh, and it's actually uh, a, a new dialect like for Erlang. So it's a new version, a modern version of Erlang. And so this is pretty much the, the main reason I chose it because it's it has reliable concurrency, it has reliable inter-process communication, it's great uh, abstractions for it because it's also uh, it's run it's run on the Beam or long virtual machine. So 
you know, everything that's great about Erlang is great about Elixir. And two, it's a functional programming language. So I told you, I see how TLA plus definitions can map really well to uh, a declarative language, such as functional programming languages. And I think this is a really nice factor. So I, right from the start, I knew I want I wanted a functional programming language. But the third factor is also important because I never wanted to generate like unreadable, messy, uh, not understandable code, right? I want to generate something that people, some peop, someone that knows the spec, that understands the spec can look at, at the code and see, oh, this definition is, 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 is here because of that definition in TLA+. So if you open the code, generated code and the spec side by side, you can easily map one thing to another and uh, with no, it, with little cognitive load, right? And one of Elixir main goals is to be, uh, is to have very uh, good legibility and maintainability, which is uh, based on a lot of Ruby, Ruby language values. Uh, and the syntax is like also very close to Ruby. So this is the the three main factors that made me chose it. Uh, but also like it's uh, open source to under Apache, so that's important. And and it's uh, cross platform, so I don't doesn't work on only one like operational system. So but that 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 is a given, right? And now let's address some of the problems. Uh, some of the difficulties of generating code that you might already be thinking of. So first of all, non-determinism. Non-determinism is always present in transition systems, more often than not. And um, the definition of non-determinism in a transition system is when is that it happens when more than one transition is defined from the same state. So I'm on a certain state, and from that state, I can go to different states doing different transitions. It's, I can choose whatever. Um, so in non-determinism, thinking about non-determinism in computer programs, they can have many different sources. So they can be input output, they can be because of concurrency, etc. And the question is how to translate a specifications no determinisms in a transition system to something executable, right? Some of some com computational non determinism. How I can map something to the other. And my first idea here was well, I should spawn a bunch of processes where each process goes a different path and they uh, we will achieve different results, right? So it's an, a very easy definition of non-determinism for me. So, for when I learned about non-determinism, I would also I would all, I would always think about like concurrency, right? Different processes running, going different paths. Uh, another thing I I thought about was like choose randomly, right? So when if I reach a point where I have non-determinism, just choose any one any of the paths and go for it. But uh, this would generate a simulation, right? So it would basically randomly walk through the transition system graph. So that was not, there were not good ideas. And then I came up uh, with the Oracle idea. And the Oracle, I guess it's the, the main compo component, component of this uh, translation called generation. And it's a, it's, it's a, a name I gave, okay, but it's basically an abstraction that will allow the programming to define how these non-determinism scenarios are computed. Okay, so basically I'm giving the responsibility to define how this will be computed for to the programmer. And how it works, it's basically a, a separate process that runs alongside the main process. And whenever the, the main process reaches some state where it doesn't know what to do because there are multiple actions that could be taken, they will send the uh, list of actions to the Oracle and the Oracle will respond to to the main process saying which action should be taken, right? So basically I will 
isolate any non-determinism to this oracle process. So if there is input, output, output uh, being read or written to determine which actions we take, Oracle will do that. If there is any random factor to the program, Oracle will do that. Uh, so any any type of non-determinism at all is always done by the Oracle, and the main process the main process is deterministic on its own. Um, so and I I I thought this is this can be a very good idea because um, as an example I gave about the the case study on the pump station. On that case, the decisions were made from uh, what sensors were reading at some given time. And then what my Oracle there do, did, right? I implemented it. So it uh, communicated with the sensors through the MKGG protocol, which is actually used by sensors in real IoT scenarios. And then the sensors would like send the the readings and the Oracle would process these readings and respond to the main process according to them these readings when the main process actually needed needed to make some non-deterministic decision, right? And as like real world interacting with the sensors is a non-deterministic factor, uh, this isolation actually worked pretty well. And now talking about the the translation, like the real translation happening in when in trying to show you how how it is, um, I wrote like a, the simplest spec I could think about a uh, spec for a traffic semaphore. So ba basically, uh, cycling a color from yellow to red, red to green, and green to yellow. Uh, I have. I'm a single variable color. Uh, I have three actions: turn red, turn yellow, and turn green. Uh, each action has a condition and a transition, so uh, the separation on the the nomenclature here. Uh, so here it's a condition, right? So color in the current state should be yellow in order for the transition to happen. Is where the color in the next state would be red. And similarly for the other two actions, um, the init state where color could be any any one between red, yellow, and green. Um, the next state action where any of the actions can be taken. Uh, this simple spec, it's good for me to show you how each action translates to two functions, two different functions. So the, the two functions generated from the turn red action would be the turn red condition and the actually turn red function. The turn red condition, actually any function with the suffix uh, condition, it receives uh, the variables which represent the state, right? So it's basically a dictionary structure, key value structure with each variable value. And it always returns a Boolean value. So here I'm comparing the current value of color to yellow and returning true or false. And the turn red action that would will actually make the transition receives a state, the variables, uh, the dictionary of variables, and returns the next state, so a, a new state which is always a dictionary. So this is a syntax and a uh, color here is the key. Red is the value. Uh, so an action definition will always be translated to this two function, something like this. And then uh, I would have a, a main function that would be generated from the next state formula. And that would call this other functions according to these conditions. And the problem he, here is I uh, have uh, the R operator here. And if, if I have the end operator, it's pretty simple, right? I just have to merge the results. So if I have turn, if I would like turn red and turn yellow, I would merge the results from turn red and turn yellow. Uh, it's very simple. But uh, with the R operator, I have a little 
more difficulty. So uh, when they have operators such as R and the existing existential quantifier, these operators they can't introduce non-determinism. Or not, because the example I just showed here is from turn red or turn yellow or turn green are actually not non-deterministic. They are deterministic, so because they are all looking um, at the the value of color and they have completely distinguished uh, condition values for it. So there can never be the case where the conditions for these three actions are more more than one of them are satisfied. There is no state where this could happen, right? So I can be sure that all always a single one of these actions are enabled at a, a at a given state. Uh, but my code generator can't know that. Okay, they, it, it it doesn't know it. And so how I detect this non-determinism, how, how I know when I have to call the oracle, remember the oracle is the abstraction used to solve non-determinism by some type of interface with the real world. world. And uh, but when how, how do I know when to call the oracle? Uh, this is this has to be decided in, um, in runtime. So whenever there is uh, operators such as R or exists, I call this. Uh, I made. I make an invocation to this function called decide. And this function ca called decide, it has a behavior such as the one described here. So it would basically look to the actions conditions. So for each action passed to this decide, well, in this case I would pass these three actions to decide. I would look for each one of them. Uh, I would look to this condition, to its condition on the current state, and see if this condition, its condition, is satisfied or not. And I would have these three possible outputs. I would halt the program, program so stop it uh, if no none of the conditions were satisfied. This would mean uh, deadlock. Uh, I would choose an action. If it's the only action whose condition is satisfied, so if for these three actions passed to the side, for only one of only one of them has its condition satisfied, basically let's suppose a uh, color equals to yellow. So the only possible action, the only condition satisfied is the condition from turn red, since color is equal to yellow. Then I would choose turn red and would make this transition. Um, and the third scenario, where more than one condition is satisfied, then I would have to call the oracle, right? So this is where, where this is what this function does, and this is how I can detect in runtime where there is no reason and where it's just like a normal or where I can the the main process can decide for itself which action to take, basically just looking at the current state. I also want to talk about uh, how to test the generated code, because one of the first things I thought would go along well with the code generation would be test generation. And a great factor to how these two things can go well together is that usually when you make test generation tools, you have to implement test harness that connects the generated tests with the with something that's executable. And on this case, since I'm generating the code, I know how the, the generated code works. I know what interfaces it has. So I can write, uh, I can generate tests that talk talks to that interfaces that I know will always exist. So if you use the code generation and the test generation together, they would know how to talk to each other and you don't have to implement test harness. Um, and test generation is what I'm working on my, my master's degree. Uh, and so that's actually why I stopped working on the cogeneration because I had to pick a different subject <laughs> to study on 
for my masters and that's what I'm doing and but but it's, I'm actually focused focused on generating tests for the to test the generated code right so it's a complement to it and I thought about two different uh, ways I could generate tests so this is what I'm proposing on my masters uh, subject to change well I, I'm open to suggestions but uh, this is my ideas for now, right? So the first type of tests I want to generate is uses the TLC state exploration graph. So when you run TLC, you can ask it to dump the states to a, a dot file, a dot dot file, and I can use this file to to obtain the state exploration graph. And one one of my goals is to generate white box tests. That meaning that I would explore internal state with these tests, where I would be calling the main function, like that function that is generated from the next state formula, and I would be calling the main function that receives a, a state and returns the new state. And for each of these changes of state done by the main function, I could check that uh, they are they match with the graph, right? So there is a transition in the graph that maps that state from the, the new state, something like that. So um, this is one of my ideas for white box testing. And for black box testing, I thought about using the TLC generated counter examples. So actually these are not counter examples from real properties. And instead they're Counter examples for the negated version of these properties. That happens because uh, if you try to generate, if you try to generate tests from counter examples, you would have a hard time finding specs with properties that actually have counter examples because usually people write properties that are true and then therefore don't have any counter examples. But if you take a true property and negate it, like not property, then you you would obtain a counter example which is called a witness of this prop the true property so i have a witness which is a basically a trace of the execution and my black box testing is to make sure that the trace is run it can be run on the generated code by using the oracle to choose the transition so i look at the trace look at what is happening on the application and when I have an opportunity to make a decision using the Oracle. The Oracle would make that would make that decision by looking at the trace and trying to reproduce it on the application. So I would be uh, I would be sure that th these witnesses from properties are can be executed on the generated code, right? So not there. Are, these are not tests that can guarantee that everything matches. Uh, unfortunately, but they can help. And one of the goals of having tests is generate code. Generated code would not be perfect, almost never, right? So maybe you, you did something on the specification for a certain purpose that you don't have the one that to happen on the execution. Maybe you want to change something. And uh, it's important that when you change something on the implementation, you don't uh, re ruin everything, right? So you don't in you don't introduce any unexpected behaviors. So if you have some tests there to help you, that may be useful, and maybe that will give more confidence for people to maybe refactor the tests because they are not perfect, right? And as I said, this is. Uh, I just developed a prototype. This is a work that it's on hold, but I have plenty of ideas and next steps for it. So first of all, I have to be able to parse and translate more of TLA plus syntax because uh, right now I can run my code generator for a very small set of examples because it just doesn't support many of syntax sugars and other auxiliary operators from TLA plus. So I just need to to increment the parser, increment the, the translation rules. And this is the main thing I have to, to do for this project to grow, okay? 
but uh, talking about other things, uh, the test generation that I'm doing right now in my master's, it's uh, an extension of this work and uh, it actually helps me. If, if I have the tests, it's easier to, to increment the code generator itself, right? Because I have tests to test the code being generated and the the code generation, if I increment it, it's, it also helps to test the test, right? So if to, it helps me to check if the tests are actually great, if they are, have good coverage, etc. So one thing helps the other. Uh, the other idea here is actually a Marcus's suggestion. So he, he suggested that I use a random Oracle, which is something I already have implemented. So an Oracle that chooses the next action randomly. Uh, choose the random Oracle to simulate transitions and then compare the results with simulations done by PlusPy, PlusPy or the TLC simulator. Uh, I can compare like uh, if they, uh, they reach the same states and if they are close in performance, what are the differences. So that should be a nice thing to do. And lastly, and actually lastly, because this is a long-term goal, but uh, to prove that the generated code matches the specification, that is uh, the set of behaviors that can be executed in the generated code matches the set of behaviors allowed by the TLA plus specification. Uh, this is a hard proof, but uh, it's something that I would need to to do bits in order to make this usable in like critical security scenarios right where where being right is very important so where mistakes would be really bad and where TLA plus is often very useful so that would be nice but it's very complicated and that's it for my presentation uh, uh here are some links because the all of this work is open source and available and i uh, you can do whatever you want with it so the code generation tool is written in haskell and it's available at my github and, and i called it tla transmutation because i thought it was funny to to use some alchemy reference since elixir is a alchemy reference so i thought it was cool and uh, the pump station case study that I mentioned, it's uh, actually, I think, a good example if you want to see something real. Uh, so actually, Elixir code generated from a little spec and uh, an actual Oracle implemented. Uh, it's not not anything that much, that fancy. Actually, I have some improvements I would like to do on that Oracle, but it was just... Uh, case study I played around so that's it thank you for watching and uh, now I think we would have time for like live questions or something first question how is the interface of the Oracle decided uh, automatically or in some other way the interface of the Oracle is actually always the same it's fixed so it always receives a uh, uh, elixir message uh, with the elixir interface where informing like uh, the action name and some some other metadata such as the the variables the it will transition to but but mainly the the action name and if it has parameters it also informs the parameters right of the the action but it's always the same Cool. Um, what does the overall program do when the generated code deadlocks? Does the program exit at that point? Yes, the execution ends. It doesn't know what to do, so it just finishes executing. Otherwise, if, the, if there is no deadlock, then the program will run forever. Right. Um, next question. What do you see missing? How much work would it be to turn your case study into a tool usable by others? Uh, I guess it's pretty much the, the first point I, I talked about in my future work, I have to increment it because um, I'm not good at writing parsers and uh, my parser can parse a very small part of TLA plus. So maybe if you, if you write a, a space in the, in the wrong 
position, maybe if you use a different operator. And there is a lot of ways to do, to write the same thing in TLA plus. And I'm only like parsing one of them always because I'm lazy and I'm not good with parser. So I, I really have to increment the parser. I don't think that incrementing the translation rules would be hard because uh, I think I have done the harder, the hardest one of hardest rules are already implemented. So pretty much like the parser for auxiliary operators and other stuff that is missing and the translation for them that should be quite easy. Gotcha. I have a question. So because I know program synthesis is a very difficult and sort of broad topic. Um, writing a proof that like proves that the output of your converter from a specific set of TLA plus is rather difficult, but it does generally require that TLA plus be well understood so that you can actually write <laughs> that, yes. that, that formal correspondence. And as you were saying, TLA plus is quite large and it's changing all the time. So it's kind of a moving target. Have you, do you have any idea of like the scope of that for people who are maybe interested in doing something like this for other languages? Like, uh, is there anything mechanized there that we can use or are we kind of starting from scratch? Okay, uh, so first of all, I don't plan to do this in the next years. <laughs> Maybe if some someday I go to a PhD, that was something I would try to work on. But uh, I don't have much experience in, in proving <laughs> And, but uh, I have a friend that suggested to me that to in order to prove that I would have to prove the co-simulation, the the B simulation between the two of them, the TLA plus and Elixir. So I have to to prove there is a B simulation between uh, Elixir reduction, right? So the evaluation and the the TLA plus reduction, which I don't have any idea how it is described on how it is the semantics of it. So I guess maybe that would be the hardest part, like to define the this reduction for TLA+. Okay, then let's thank Gabriela.